Hi, as we continue our studies today, every night at 9 o'clock, we continue from Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. We stopped at verse 3 yesterday. And this is uh, perhaps the one of the best known verses from the book of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. The King James Version goes as rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. <clears throat> as I said at the beginning of the introduction to this book, the title to this book is uh, primarily about joy or rejoicing. <clears throat> and Paul writes this, in the midst of all kinds of troubles, he wasn't sure whether his life or his imprisonment was going to end with uh, his uh, execution. He was going to lose his life. He, he didn't know how long he has to be in prison. But in the midst of all that, Paul is rejoicing, as we have seen in earlier verses. In addition to that, he is also asking the believers to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. <clears throat> Some Bible verses to encourage us in this time of trouble Habakkuk chapter 3 verses 17 and 18 though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will be joyful in God my Savior so even if our circumstances are bad and they let us down, Habakkuk says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my savior. James chapter one and verse two, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. 1 Peter four and verse 13, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory and uh, <clears throat> first Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 16 very clearly says in very uh, in a very shortened form rejoice evermore in the King James version and in the NIV be joyful always so putting all these verses together it's not just Philippians 4 4 that is telling us to rejoice <clears throat> but the whole word of God again and again tells believers to rejoice now how can believers rejoice i got a fairly long quotation from a good christian writer called jovet and he says and i quote no matter how dark the circumstances of life may be it is always possible for the christian to rejoice in the lord joy ought to be present in the lives of all who enjoy all the spiritual blessings that are in the Lord. Christian joy is a mood independent of our immediate circumstances. Christian joy has no relationship to the transient setting of life and therefore it is not the victim of the passing day. And this is how he finishes that paragraph. Here is the secret. Lo, I am with you all the days. The prosperous days and the days of adversity. Days when the wedding bell is ringing and the days when the funeral bell is tolling. All the days, the day of life, the day of death, the day of judgment. So, as we have seen before, Christian joy or Christian rejoicing is uh, independent of our circumstances. Now, happiness comes from our circumstances. So, you pass an exam or you uh, win a lottery or you get a good job. Something like that happens and you feel happy. But that happiness can be taken away when the circumstances go the other way around. But joy in the Lord is dependent on our relationship with God, dependent on our daily walk with God. It is dependent on the fact that we have a great and a glorious destiny for all eternity. It is dependent on the fact that we are children of God. We are the sons and daughters of the everlasting God. And it is, <coughs> it is based on the fact that we are servants of the great master so rejoice in the lord always i will say it again rejoice for the sake of emphasis paul is repeating that rejoice in the lord always i will say it again rejoice verse 5 let your gentleness be evident to all the lord is near now gentleness here the greek word 
is uh, primarily um, equitable. Gentleness goes as equitable, fair, mild, or it can also be translated as gentle. So it uh, refers to Christ-like consideration for others, a willingness to give up one's own way. There are people who are sometimes quite uh, dogmatic about what they want and they're not willing to move away from that. But uh, here, let your gentleness be evident to all means, give way to others. And uh, we live in a culture where we boast of a 2,500 year old uh, civilization. But sometimes the way we drive in this country, obviously, you know, we are not gentle at all. Even where, you know, you come to a roundabout, we are supposed to give way to a vehicle from the right. Most people, 99% of the people don't do that. So that's a classic example of willingness to give up our own way so that others can go ahead. So two people approach a door, you allow the other person to go first. You know, they call it gentlemanly, uh, you know, but it's more than gentlemanly. It is a biblical concept. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Let people see that you are willing to give up your own way and you're treating others better than yourself. Why? In that same verse, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The reason is because the Lord Jesus is coming soon. So the next great event in God's prophetic calendar or schedule is the Lord's return. The whole period from uh, the Lord's first coming to the establishing or the consummation of the kingdom, which is uh, shown in the New Testament as in the last days, uh, all these will happen primarily with the uh, return of our Lord Jesus Christ. From God's vantage point, a thousand years is like just a day that has gone by. Thus, there is a sense in it that in every generation we feel that the time is getting closer and closer and closer. Even though there are no signs in the Bible for the rapture, you can see that uh, the things that are happening today in the world you can see that the coming events are casting their shadows. So we know that the Lord's coming is near. And we should be excited in our generation. Perhaps some in our generation will not experience death. They will be part of the rapture even while they are living. So that is uh, Philippians 4, 5. Now we go on to Philippians 4 and verse 6, an amazing verse. Do not be anxious about anything. Let me read it again for the sake of um, emphasis. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. It's an amazing verse. Ideal verse in these troubled times. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. The word anxious, do not be anxious. The word anxious comes from a Greek word called merimna, which basically means being uh, drawn or pulled in different directions. Uh, think of the uh, ancient day um, method of executing a person would be to tie the four limbs to four different wild horses and they will all pull in different directions and you are basically torn apart. That's the same meaning that comes here. So being anxious is being pulled or drawn in different directions. That is being distracted by the many cares of life. It is self-centered, counterproductive worry, not legitimate cares or concerns about the spread of the gospel. We can worry about or we can be anxious about people not coming to the Lord or anxious about the spread of the gospel or the body of Christ. That's not what we are talking about here. Here, being anxious about unnecessary things, the things of this world. This is, as I've said, is counterproductive worry. So 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, Peter tells us, cast all your anxiety or your cares upon him because he cares for you. None of us go through this world without cares and worries. We live in an imperfect world and nothing goes according to plan. The best laid plans of men and mice, you know what happens to them. So when things don't work according to our plan, when things happen in a way which we don't like, 
We are not supposed to sit down and worry and be anxious. Instead of that, the word of God tells us to roll all our worries, cast all our worries and cares and anxieties into the Lord's hands and then sleep in peace. Because it is the Lord's problem. We pass it on to him. He cares for us. Interestingly, the old English word from which we get the modern day English word worry primarily means to strangle. Just imagine if somebody strangles you at your throat or by your throat or strangles your throat rather. You know, that's what worry is. When you're worrying, you're strangling yourself. Worry is wrong thinking of the mind and it is wrong feeling of the heart about circumstances, people and things. Let me say that again. Worry is wrong thinking and wrong feeling about circumstances, people and things. Most of the time, worry is uh, we worry about things that are totally and utterly beyond our control. There's no point doing that because you're not going to control it. Worry is the greatest thief of joy. We no should not be worrying or be fearful about the future because we, win we should never take God out of the equation. Where there is God, he will protect us, he will look after us, he will provide for us. And by worrying, we are not going to do anything. So just cast all your cares, cast all your anxiety upon the Lord because he cares for us. Don't be anxious about everything. But Paul says, he uses the word but here, he says that you can overcome worry with prayer. Anxiety and prayer are the two great opposing forces of Christian experience. Now that's very important. The antidote for prayer, well, pardon me, the antidote for worry is prayer, thanksgiving and petition. Uh, let me say that again. The antidote for worry is prayer, thanksgiving and petition. We must live in an attitude, an atmosphere of prayer. First Thessalonians 5.17, pray continually. The King James Version puts it as pray without ceasing or pray without stopping. It means that live in an attitude of prayer. Not that we close our eyes on the road and uh, pray and walk. What it means is wherever you are, morning, noon and night, whatever the situation, always be in an attitude of prayer. William MacDonald puts it so beautifully in his, uh, uh, in his uh, book on Philippians. He says, Not anxious for nothing, prayerful in everything, thankful for anything. Anxious for nothing, or oh, pardon me, anxious in nothing, prayerful in everything, thankful for anything. And if you practice this, you will definitely be a joyful person. And verse 7 continues to build on this. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, the peace of God is not merely a psychological state of mind, but it, it is the inner tranquility based on peace with God. The peaceful state of those who are forgiven. There are three types of peace I notice in the word of God. The first one is peace with God. Now we are a race that is at rebellion with God. We are enemies of God and we are in the enemy territory, in the enemy camp. So we cannot have peace with God unless we come to him through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 tells that now that you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that is the first element, the vertical aspect of our peace. We have peace with God. So once you have peace with God, you can have the peace of God. So when we are in a right relationship with God, God will give us his peace because our sins are forgiven. John 14, 27, beautiful words. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. These are the Lord's uh, emphatic words before he went to the cross. So when you have peace with God, 
that's the vertical you will have the peace of god that is internal when you have that you will have peace with men that is horizontal and external so when we are right with god we are in a right relationship with god we will have that inner peace and we will be at peace with others in our community we'll be peacemakers as well as friends and uh, good friends and the people who love others so the peace of god remember is an inner tranquility that is based on peace with god so inner peace is the opposite of anxiety inner peace is the tranquility that comes when the believer casts or rolls over all his cares to god in prayer and worries about them no more so one of the things that i do i sleep well i must admit that and as soon as my head hits the pillow i'm gone that's what my wife tells me so the moment you are going to bed just sit there pray cast all your anxiety upon the lord and then you will sleep well but then it becomes his problem one of my favorite themes and one uh, one uh, p- paragraph from that team is uh, from by the him by francis ridley havergill stayed upon jehovah hearts are fully blessed finding as he promised perfect peace and rest stayed upon jehovah hearts are fully blessed finding as he promised perfect peace and rest here the paul uh, the apostle paul speaks about the peace of god which transcends all understanding what is the word transcend means it means in the original greek to rise above to surpass to excel to go above so the people of this world cannot understand this peace at all and even uh, christians who possess this peace uh, find a, a wonderful element of mystery about it you know we as christians when we experience that inner peace we are surprised at our own lack of anxiety in the face of tragedy or adverse circumstances about a year after i became a believer in christ way back in 1982 the 1983 uh, riots came about and a uh, lot of us our uh, lives were in danger but even as the mobs were coming down the lane where i was staying there was perfect peace in my heart that was the first time i was one year old in the lord that was the first time i actually experienced that inner peace in in a in a practical sense because the lord was with me and uh, this verse continues to say will uh, guard this uh, per- this peace of god which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in christ jesus again the greek word guard means to guard or keep under guard or protect by guarding it is a military concept of a sentry standing guard you go past um, the house of an important a person or vip or go past a, a, a military camp you have soldiers standing outside under uh, on on guard so the heart and mind of a believer who trusts in the lord jesus is a well garrisoned stronghold and no matter what the assaults that are coming from the outside there will be peace inside of us in this world we will have opposition in this world we will have trouble the lord jesus taught us that so as we stand in battle against uh, the spiritual forces of wickedness and darkness in the high places against satan and his demons as we fight against them in the spiritual realm on the outside inside of us there will be peace so god's uh, protective custody of those who are in christ jesus extends to the core of their beings and to their deepest to their deepest intentions it goes deep down inside so as long as our hearts and minds are resting in christ the peace of god will stand guard over us if you look at uh, daniel chapter 6 verses 1 to 10 we see there is prayer there is supplication there is thanksgiving so paul tells us that uh, we need to in everything we must go with prayer 
petition and with thanksgiving many a time we are very good at when we are praying we are very good at uh, prayer and petition but we are very poor when it comes to thanksgiving give thanks for everything in all circumstances give thanks why because uh, we need to be a grateful people uh, remember those uh, 10 lepers who were healed by the lord jesus only one came back and he wasn't a jew himself so people are uh, we lack gratitude our dogs have more gratitude uh, uh, show more gratitude to us than the gratitude that we show to god i just want to quote a, a, a beautiful hymn but before that a quote from william mcdonald what a needed tonic in this day of neurosis nervous breakdown tranquilizers and mental distress i've always said for any kind of mental problems or depression the best cure is philippians chapter 4 now listen to these words we sing this often what a friend we have in jesus all our sins and griefs to bear what a privilege to carry everything to god in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Cumbered with a load of care. Precious Saviour, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do your friends despise, forsake you? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield you. You will find a solace there. Blessed Saviour, thou hast promised. Thou wilt all our burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing all to thee in earnest prayer. Soon in glory bright unclouded, there will be no need for prayer. Rapture, praise, and endless worship will be our sweet portion there. This uh, hymn was written, beautiful hymn was written in, way back in 1855 by Joseph Scriven. And he wrote it to comfort his mother who was across the seas from him in Ireland. And also another beautiful hymn for, written by John S. Brown. I cannot tell thee whence it came, this peace within my breast. But this I know, there fills my soul, a strange and tranquil rest. There's a deep settled peace in my soul. There's a deep settled peace in my soul. Though the billows of sin near me roll, he abides, Christ abides. Beneath the toil and care of life, this hidden stream flows on. My weary soul no longer thirsts, nor am I sad alone. So... The word of God encourages us that we should go to God with our prayers, petitions, with thanksgiving and roll over our anxieties into his hands. And then the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Then we come to uh, chapter 4 and verse 8 like this is still building up to a climax. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So it gives a positive spin to our faith. In verse 7, the previous verse, Paul had assured the believers that God would garrison, protect their hearts and thoughts in Christ Jesus. But in this verse, he also reminds us that we too have a responsibility in this matter. God will protect our hearts and minds, but we also have a part to play. Now, David's heart and mind, for example, wasn't garrisoned in God when he sinned with Bathsheba. So Paul understood the influence of uh, one's thoughts in one's life. Our thought life is very important. It determines what we do with our lives. Our thoughts determine our behavior. Uh, when a person allows his mind, um, or, or rather what a person allows into his mind, sooner or later will, uh, de uh, will dominate and determine his speech and his action. So, Paul specifies eight motives 
which all who seek maturity should keep constantly in mind in this particular verse remember philippians 4 verse 8 there are eight elements first one whatever is true truth as a rule of conduct covering all possible spheres and relationships in one's life now truth means not false not unreliable but genuine and real so 90 if a statement is 90 percent true and 10 percent false it is still false because lies are like poison whether you put uh, 1% poison or 99% poison, it's going to kill somebody. So lies are like that. Even if there's 1% lie in a statement, then it is poisonous. It is sinful. So when Paul says whatever is true means, whenever we say something or we write something, it must be absolutely true, 100% true. Not even something that is a bit gray. Uh, with Paul, everything is white and black secondly whatever is noble in the king james version it says honest the greek word for that is semnos in uh, classical greek this word semnos is used as a characteristic of the gods means uh, venerable august or reverend the things that pertain to the heavenly world so whatever is noble presents the idea of dignity and majesty that inspires reverence and relates to either persons or deeds, means being honorable and morally attractive. See, the Lord Jesus was morally perfect and attractive. If you look at even his worst enemies, none of them could bring a moral accusation against uh, or accusation based on uh, immorality or a lack of morals from the Lord Jesus. No one could say that he committed adultery or he stole something or he lied or uh, he, uh, uh, he, he, he stole some uh, or he uh, hurt somebody. Primarily, they took his claims and they misinterpreted them. So he was honorable and morally attractive. Third element, whatever is right. Greek word dikios, which means righteous conduct, doing what is right and just. What would Jesus do? Remember the WWJD bracelets of the uh, 1970s and 80s. What would Jesus do in a situation like that? Exactly the same thing that we should be doing, whatever is right. The fourth one, whatever is pure. Greek word is hagnos. From that you get uh, the word holy. Means untainted. So whatever is pure means the right conduct in the sense of abstaining from evil. High moral character. And the best example from the Bible is none other than Joseph in the Old Testament. So whatever is pure means of high moral character. Then Whatever is lovely, the fifth element, means anything that's pleasable or pleasing rather, agreeable, amiable. So anything that is uh, nice to people would make them smile, would make them happy. Then sixth element, whatever is admirable, King James Version says, of good report. Euphemus is the uh, Greek word, which means fair speaking or well sounding praiseworthy attractive appealing so whatever is admirable anything that is good anything that is uh, pleasing then the seventh element if anything is excellent here this uh, greek word arete is moral courage integrity or moral excellence so when you say about talk about anything that is excellent, think about things that are morally excellent. The eighth and the final element is praiseworthy. If uh, a Christian ought to be ready to praise anything and everything that is worthy of commendation, even if it comes from uh, somebody uh, whom we don't like. So this combination of these eight virtues will produce a wholesome 
thought pattern which in turn will result in a life of moral and spiritual excellence now when we think about these things we'll be able to do god's will in all things so i'm going to stop with uh, chapter 4 verse 8 of philippians i'll read that again finally brothers and sisters whatever is true one whatever is noble whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is uh, lovely whatever is admirable if anything is excellent or praiseworthy think about such things so it's an amazing verse it has taken up to a to a climax so god willing tomorrow we will continue from uh, chapter 4 and verse 9 and as i always do i will uh, upload it to my facebook page as soon as we finish praying and if you had come in late or you want to watch it again you can go to my facebook page and uh, you can watch this i believe god is speaking to us through this series and uh, we meet every night sri lanka time 9 o'clock 9 pm and uh, we are now studying the book of uh, um, of philippians we finished with the book of james and now we are going on to the book of philippians so let us pray together our father in heaven once again we thank you and praise you lord for the wonderful day that you have given to each one of us which is a gift from god lord in the midst of life's challenges disappointments cares worries and anxieties we thank you father we can cast all our anxiety on you because you care for us lord you care for us more than we care for our own selves lord you understands our fears you understands our disappointments because the lord jesus became human and he understands us as a perfect high priest lord we pray and ask that whatever we study here on a daily basis will contribute towards our spiritual well-being towards our spiritual maturity and growth and will lead us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake in the name of jesus christ our lord and savior we pray amen so please join me tomorrow night at 9 pm god bless you and sleep well